Welcome to Stand Up for Doctors. I'm your host, Kim Downey. Thank you very much for joining us. Today, I'd like to welcome Dr. Adam Harrison. Welcome, Adam. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> hi, hi. I'm, I'm just, I'm starstruck by uh, by your beautiful <laughs> smile, Kim. I I couldn't even think to speak. <laughs> so, so, hi, so Adam. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> well, I'll go ahead and, uh, and as far as introductions, um, Adam is a trauma-informed international leadership coach, an organizational trainer, a keynote speaker, a podcaster, an online course creator, a work workplace bullying advocate, former family physician, and a qualified lawyer. You wear a lot of hats, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me sound really busy. I'm re I'm really not that busy. Okay. <laughs> It's so well, it's so lovely to be here, Kim, and such an honor to be to be in your presence. Yeah, I really well, appreciate thank it. you, and I'm I'm so I'm just so happy to have you. So I usually share how we uh, first met. So we connected on LinkedIn, and I look back, and the first message I sent you was back in June, and it was in response to a post of yours that I think was about like a poor experience you were having in the LinkedIn space. And I reached out to tell you I could relate as I had recently had a similar experience. So I always like to see how we actually started communicating. <laughs> and then um, a couple of weeks later, you reached out to me and said it would be great to meet sometime if I was up for a Zoom call. So <clears throat> we did that. And I remember what, what particularly amazed me about that is when we got on the call, we just started chatting like we talked every day, right? Or just chatted last week about like totally random things. And then it's funny because we didn't end up having maybe the kind of conversation I would have anticipated that we would have had where we usually say like, I tell you about me, you tell me about you, right? But it felt like we already knew the things, <laughs> right? I, ca I can't believe it's only been six months. It, uh, yeah, you know, right? when, um, when, when someone, when, when we, blessed to have someone like you coming to our lives it just it's just such a gift and if it, it feels like longer in a really really good way um as you say i feel we feel like we knew each other so it's an instant connection I'm, yeah I'm so well thank you adam I, I feel exactly the same way <laughs> um so in this episode we'll be uh touching on our recent kevin md article collaboration and mm. we'll talk about the effects in recovery from trauma and bullying during medical training and we'll talk about the various ways that Adam is raising awareness and offering support to individuals and organizations in that regard. Um, so as we get started, what would you most like our audience to know about you, Adam? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I think most most importantly, I am a, um, a husband and, um, and, and father. I have two young youngest children uh, getting older by the second. Yeah, they're 10 and 10 and seven, um, both girls. And um, I, I love my family time. Um, and I'm a, I'm a doting son and and brother uh, to two two sisters. And I have a lot of I have a lot of women in my in my life and a lot of female influences in my life. And, you know, the, the next generation is my daughters. And so, you know, part of what I'm I'm doing is you know it's family first family and friends first but the work I'm doing is a kind of a legacy you know the the stuff I do with my podcast and so on so it's everything is intertwined with me you know work and work and family yeah I um, love that would you like to mention your podcast uh, yeah of course <laughs> <laughs> it's it's called inspiring women oh. leaders and uh it's been running now uh just over 18 months uh we're on episode 41 i think is just the latest or 42 um it comes out every two weeks and it's on the health podcast network uh website it has its own web page and obviously all the usual places apple spotify google podcasts uh amazon prime audible all of that so please um, you know, if you're interested in learning about leadership from these amazing, amazing women that I have the honor to interview, then then please head over there and, and take a listen. And if you like it, share it. And yeah, there's lots of good learning there. 
Absolutely. And I think I know some of your guests, so it's awesome. You know quite a few. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, I first thought I'd mention, um, cause our article, uh, that we collaborated with, uh, for Kevin MD, um, with Brittany, Dr. Brittany Lamb, uh, the title is physicians turn feelings of frustration and powerlessness into purpose and hope. And um, that will lead us into really what we're going to talk about in relation to you today is what you touched on in the article and uh, your trauma-informed training. And uh, my understanding is that many, most, or all, almost all physicians seem to experience uh, some level of trauma and or bullying during their medical training. And they might not recognize it as such at the time. And I have this book and it's called The Body Keeps the Score, right? And I yeah, think that yeah. speaks to that. So what I was wondering is if you could talk about some examples of trauma or bullying uh, that are perhaps more subtle or that physicians might feel shame around thinking it was them, like being humiliated during rounding. Because I know some doctors don't perceive it at the time as bullying and it's not until much later when they seek out therapy or coaching mm. that they can actually identify it as bullying. Yeah, absolutely. I That resonates with me. I mean, it was certainly the case for me. I experienced um, quite a lot of workplace bullying as a, as a trainee, junior doctor, trainee surgeon, especially. Um, and um, yeah, I you just... <laughs> You get on with it. You push. You push those those feelings aside. You know you need to get your reference for your next job, and uh, you still have a you still have a job to do. You have patients to to care for, and you know bills to pay, and every, you know it all kind of you just yeah you just com compartmentalize it. I think, but you know that when we when we do that, when we push things aside and we ignore them, they just they just fester, and at some point they're gonna rear their ugly head you know and as you've alluded to um the you know what was it you said the body the, the body, body keeps the score keeps it's actually score. a book the i, I have that score. i've been yeah. reading a little bit yeah yeah so true so true both you know kind of physical and and psychological manifestations so um yeah i mean the way i i mean you asked me to speak to uh about the more, kind of more subtle forms and more kind of you know what we as an individual would might consider more shameful forms of workplace bullying. The way, the way I kind of think about it is I, I sort of break it down into overt types of bullying, which is the, you know, the kind of what most people think of as bullying, you know, the kind of classic playground, you know, schoolyard mm -hmm. type type stuff. And, you know, there's, there's lots of examples of that. I just have a, a, a quick list, you know, the kind of physical aggression, threats, intimidation, sexual harassment racial discrimination um other types of discrimination you know homophobia personal attacks on a on a, on a person's characteristics and and the, the list goes on um and they're the ones that most people think of um and then there's the the covert so you have the overt ones and the covert ones are the more subtle the more subtle ones that you you asked about you know so the passive aggression gaslighting you know um ableism micromanagement i make a distinction between micromanagement and over monitoring of work um and then i've had a, an interesting kind of conversation with one of my guests actually um and dr omalara um whose whose episode is coming out soon and um when we talked about some of the problems she had faced in her medical career um she's a woman of color she's a, a black doctor and we talked about microaggressions and casual racism and it was a, a fantastic learning point for me because she, as she said there's nothing micro about microaggressions mm -hmm. to the recipient right you right. know to her every, it's you know you say it's the old death by a thousand cuts um, right. analogy but for her it was like you know death by ma a thousand mm -hmm. massive gaping wounds yeah, you know every right, every right, kind of right. you know subtle um snipe that's that had at, had at her you know feels like it's just so insidious you know um and 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 casual racism is another thing there's nothing really casual about casual racism really right. you know if you uh if you intentionally choose not to sit next to a person of color on the bus mm -hmm. right you know that, that to me that's that's not a casual thing that's a, right. i am i am 
I am electing to to not sit next to that person because of their color, you know. So, right. so although they are on the face of it, you know, more covert types of bullying. Um, and then there's a the kind of the more work related stuff, and some of this is subtle, and some of it is not subtle, you know. So, we'll as as doctors, we'll all have uh, experienced excessive, massively excessive amounts of criticism and like negative feedback you know um not and it's not even constructive generally it is just unkind um very much a lack of praise it's the feedback is always 99 percent unpleasant and very occasionally you might get a pat on the back for, for a job well done very very occasionally but mostly mostly praise is not forthcoming um not allowing you to engage in training opportunities withholding you know, those sorts of um, responsibilities in your job and so on to kind of keep you back. Um, over monitoring your work, I mentioned before, which I think is a really deeply intentional way of making someone feel uncomfortable um, at work. And and just things like setting unrealistic goals for you. So, mm-hmm. you know, I want you to achieve this when they know full well, there's absolutely no chance you're going to do it in the time frame or with the resources you've got. So withholding the resources needed to do that um giving you unrealistic workload to do deadlines that are too short all these sorts of things they're all designed to kind of trip you up right. and make you feel you know less than right um so those are those are a lot of the things that i kind of encounter when i talk to physicians about this um, right yeah thank you and you mentioned the term gaslighting and i'm not sure that everyone is familiar with that would Mm -hmm. you be willing to share like a specific example of gaslighting or explain that a little bit more yeah yeah sure i think i think in its most basic form it's where another person is attempting to make you feel uh unsure and make you doubt yourself you know in the extreme it's to to make you feel like you're going crazy Mm -hmm. essentially and there's I mean when I first heard the term and then I did some research into it and I was like oh there was a there was some films from the early 1940s there were there were a couple um and it was based actually on a stage play um and a a a gentleman had come into a woman's life who he knew she had lots of money and he was attempting to con her out of her money it was set in Victorian times and so he would one of the things he did was he kept changing the lighting of these gas lights mm. in the home. Ah. But he would go to the house next door and do something with them. Ah. And she would say she he would come back and she'd say, Oh, the, the lighting level seems a bit a bit low, a bit dim or whatever. And he'd like, What are you talking about? It's complete, it's exactly the same as it has been the whole time. There's nothing wrong with it. You're losing your mind. And he was sort of persuading her that she was losing her mind so that he could get her. Um, put into an asylum because it was saying Victorian times and then he would get all her money and this is how you know this is what people do and it's done in you know kind of these domestic situations it's done in work situations you know like say say the um, you say to your supervisor well um, you asked me to do this piece of work but you didn't give me that essential bit of information to do the work Mm -hmm. of course I did why would I why would I do that why would I not give you that information of course I did you you know, I think you need to go back and check because, you know, you're losing your marbles, you know, check your emails because, I, de- you know, and it. so that would be an example of of it in, in the workplace. Um, right. So I didn't helps. realize. So is that where the term came from? Yeah. From yeah, that? yeah. OK, I didn't realize yeah. Gaslight that. Gaslight is actually. called. Yeah. So that's interesting to yeah. hear the history behind it. And I had an experience fairly recently that I I would consider possibly uh, gaslighting. And mm. so now I know what that feels like too. Like, I think I feel like a lot of things that happened to me over the past few years, then I can yeah. understand, yeah. you know, other people better from a, like a true place of knowing. So, um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I fully yeah. appreciate how that feels. Um, yeah. And also uh, yeah, criticism in the workplace. So that's been, has that been like just pervasive in medical culture since the dawn of time? Because it doesn't sound like it's just in America, right? And... Absolutely. I mean, um, it's interesting. I, I first came across this concept of pimping um, when I started working with American physicians. It's not it's it's not a term with that meaning in the UK. It's more to do with sort of prostitution and pimps and right. things like that. So when I heard it, I was like, right, you know, does right. that mean? Um, but you know, I'm learning a lot more about American um, vernacular and, and culture and and so on. Um, and um, yeah, so it it's essentially 
what you would say in the UK is um, teaching by ritual humiliation. Mm -hmm. All right. So you get someone to the bedside in the in the group of you know, six, eight students, whatever the attending is, is next to the patient. And you then start kind of like, you know, um, quick fire questions and just absolutely lambast someone if they don't know the answer to it you know, and just show them up, embarrass them in, in front of their peers and the patient. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's deeply unpleasant. Um, but yeah, I, I think, yeah, the dawn of time is, is mm. <laughs> it's a good era to to describe it. It's, it's very, it's very old fashioned, you know, it's almost, it's a sort of Victorian kind of approach, I think, you know, <laughs> dinosaurs really. <laughs> right. And until yeah. I've been engaged in these spaces and having so many conversations with physicians, I never realized the extent of it. And it is very different than, um, you know, my training for physical therapy, um, mm. where that was more. So the program I went to, uh, I went to Ithaca College and they accepted a certain number of students as freshmen. And that program mm. was delineated from the day you were admitted. So you couldn't really transfer in because we took special classes, you know, even as freshmen mm -hmm. and we had almost no electives because back then it was a four year bachelor's. So it was very intense for four years, but they would graduate. They said, once you get in, you know, that we had to have um, at least, I guess, like a, a C plus or something in, in, all, in, in every subject, I think, and especially mm. all the core ones. But as long as you kept passing, then they would graduate as many of us, you know, as uh, mm. as as we as they could. Um, yeah. And now, sadly, like some kids who really did want to be physical therapists, like from the time they were like 11 and had like a grandpa that had a stroke or they had an athletic injury. Um, and sometimes they would, um, you know, not get the grades they needed and they would have to drop out. Um, but we were very supportive of each other. Mm. And it was nice that there was no competition. And yeah. but I did hear even back then we had heard over like it Cornell, whether this was true or not, but I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't that sometimes some med students would like rip pages out of like library medical books. So then the other students couldn't access them. Mm. I, I could, I could believe that. I mean, it's a fiercely competitive place and it sounds like you were, you were nurtured in a, an environment where they, they wanted to see you succeed. Yeah. And I would say, um, and even the professors, like, I don't really, I don't remember them humiliating us. Um, and I just remember, I felt like the professors were supportive of us and we mm. were supportive of each other and even our clinical rotations, you know, when I'd be mm. uh, supervised by another physical therapist. Um, so I was really blessed. I didn't, um, mm. you know, have that situation, but now I, I, you know, I'm coming to understand it and I just think it's horrible. <laughs> it's hard yeah. enough. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, what approaches are you finding most helpful for recovery from trauma? Yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I always kind of think that we're all traumatized to an extent you know be it from our, our childhood and our, our, our parents or other other relatives or unkind people in our classes and 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 so on um and then you get into the workplace or you go to university and and you know there's there's further trauma there you get into the workplace and well this is what this is all about isn't it it's, it's really it's really prevalent um my approach is 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 very much that uh, the the key thing is to provide a psychologically safe space, you know, for for the person, and um, and part of that for me is just to emphasise that everything they say is confidential. There has to be kind of full trust there between the you know the coach and the client, and you know one of the things in my coaching school, which is a positive psychology school of coaching, is to come at um, every kind of coaching session towards the client from a place of unconditional positive regard so ass assume the best and and you know um look for the best in in people and then i think that the next thing is when when someone knows that 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 they are safe and that everything is confidential and that they they they're starting to trust you is let them open up you know just let let it be um a process of of deep active listening you know um and also if you feel able to uh share if it's appropriate i mean obviously listening is the key and and it's about the client it's not about 
the coach but if they want you to share you know and um and you feel comfortable being vulnerable that also helps engender trust so i think do that when it's appropriate um but also a lot of doctors have, have a really hard time of um acknowledging and admitting that they have this weakness they see it as a weakness you know that um has led them to be bullied um or you know with other things like if they are depressed or anxious or something you know a lot of doctors really struggle with um admitting that to themselves let alone to to a third party you know so you've got to tread very very carefully and and let people come to that in their own time um but it, until they've acknowledged and admitted it then they can't start the healing process you know um I think coach people towards a positive goal. You know, it's not therapy. It's not a retrospective thing. Um, so that might be that they really feel they need to increase their self-confidence so that they can stand up to bullies in the future better, you know, um, or they have a really overactive uh, inner critic, you know, our kind of um, our inner voice, our automatic negative thoughts are very uh, overactive. So to, to help kind of quieten them, that might be one of their aims. And then I think, um, you know, I do a lot of sort of affirmation type work with people, you know, and um, some of that come, forms part of my mantra, which I'll come back to. But it's, you know, that they are telling themselves that it's not their fault. They're telling themselves that they have no reason to feel ashamed, you know, and they and they do that regularly and repeatedly um, and really just encourage um what uh, I, I've learned more about from a good mutual friend of ours, Dr. Gillian Riggett, you know, around self-compassion and, and kind of, you know, fierce and tender hey, self-compassion. is. <laughs> <laughs> She'll talk about this. She's amazing. Her knowledge of of Kristen Neff's work on self-compassion is, uh, is fantastic. So really encourage self-compassion and self-care, um, especially, you know, a lot of these, you know, we've talked about the kind of physical and psychological manifestations of uh, experiencing workplace bullying and one of that is chronic stress you know and it's just there all of the time and how to manage chronic stress you know um and then ultimately it's about self-development so you know improving your confidence being feeling more more positive and then more advanced skills like becoming more assertive and learning how to deal with conflict you know manage conflict healthily you know a lot of people see conflict as something to be avoided and it's a negative thing but actually if we can conflict well mm -hmm. you know we can we can really change you know reframe situations um so I do all of that with uh with people who kind of experience bullying so Hmm. No, that sounds good. I have a little bit of training in crucial conversations, which along hmm. those lines, and that's been <clears throat> very helpful, Um, even hmm. with some conversations that I needed to have with uh, some doctors about my own medical care about the past few yeah. years. And I thought yeah. that was uh, yeah powerful to have uh, that training. And I also love about you telling them, you know, it's not you and you are not alone, right? That's, yeah, that's yeah, critical. Yeah. These things happening is, is relatively universal. Yeah. Yeah. No, ab absolutely. Um, probably haven't got time to go into it now, but I always, the, the, the statistics are quite staggering and there's a, a paper from, uh, JAMA, the journal of the American medical association from 1990 that, that, you know, cited, prevalence of uh when you get to attending level that i think it was 80 to 90 percent of people have had some kind of brush with with workplace bullying in the medical workplace mm -hmm. um so you know when you walk down i said doing the, the corridor walk when you're walking down and you're passing your fellow doctors it's almost invariable that they've experienced it as well mm -hmm. so you're you're so not alone you know but we don't want to share it so we don't talk about it so we don't right. know that we're not alone so right. well and thank you for being my guest because that that's so important to shed light on uh, these topics so i appreciate it because <laughs> every <laughs> time a doctor shares their story another doctor feels less alone i've said that Absolutely. before and yeah that's, that's very true yeah yeah 100 yeah, percent. yeah, yeah. Um, well, is there anything else you'd like to share either about your current career ventures or uh, just anything else you want to share uh, with our audience? Um, current career. So uh, as as you know, um, I'm going through a bit of a big life transition. My family and I are, are moving to New Zealand from the UK. 
Um, so I'm just going to be, you know, kind of uh, re rebuilding my business over there, I guess, and and carrying on coaching um, individuals and groups and um, training in organisations around well-being, so self care, burnout, resilience, workplace bullying um and leadership development so they're my two things well-being and leadership and actually the uh, interaction between well-being and leadership um and as you say my podcast will will continue um inspiring women leaders um and i'll carry on doing the the other things of professional speaking i have an online course and i'm planning to write some more online courses um in terms of um i think you mentioned about advice to advice to doctors and medical students and so on in general, um, I actually was uh, had an interview on the um, the RX for Success podcast. I don't know if you a lot of doctors will know the RX for Success podcast. Um, brilliant, brilliant podcast, and and it, it gave me a chance to reflect. What's my what is my prescription for success? And I think some of it is um, spending spending more time with your family, as much time with your family as you can. Mm-hmm. Always think before if you can in the heat of the moment before responding is there a kinder is there a kinder way to behave is there a kinder way to respond um be values value centered you know so try and live love and lead through your values and do work in alignment with your values which i very much do now um be compassionate to yourself and others as i mentioned and have a have a mentor and a group of trusted friends and and colleagues to kind of bounce ideas of get sense checks from because we you know we often don't share things we're concerned about and that just leads us down all sorts of rabbit holes mm-hmm. right, <laughs> <You right. know? laughs> um but uh yeah that that's that's the kind of yeah main advice that i would like to share well that's um, all great advice and when you said the word values that made me think and i think i shared that you shared a post about your values and like three of your top values were exactly i have a thing on you know my yeah. bullet board that talks about uh, love honesty and humor uh yeah. we're both uh three of us they were our top values uh, so something yeah. else we have in common <laughs> <laughs> it was written in the stars that we should that we should meet i think yeah exactly from across the pond i love it (laughs) so uh how can our listeners get in touch with you okay so um email um doctor so dr.adamharrison at gmail.com um my website is uh just www.com dradamharrison.com uh recently, recently heard heard someone say dradam dradam harrison and that's how it's spelled Drad, dradam harrison <laughs> it's, oh, wow. <laughs> it's like yeah maybe i should maybe i should open with that um <laughs> li- linkedin as you know i'm there you know with you um in our in our virtual community uh dr adam harrison on linkedin and um and my podcast inspiring women leaders reach out um about that i'm always looking for for good guests and so on so yeah all right well that sounds fantastic so uh thank you once again i it was um thrilling to have you adam (laughs) thank you kim uh honestly um you are you have very quickly become an absolutely essential part of my network and and the network of people like michael who uh you mentioned and jillian and, and all of us i think we all we all love you so much and we're so we're so grateful for you um so yeah i'm just so honored to to be on your on your show thank you thank you so much well well, thank you and i know that everyone uh appreciates i'm working for you and you're working for me and (laughs) we're all supporting (laughs) each other and it's uh it's just a beautiful thing to witness (laughs) it really is it really is okay so in closing to move the needle in healthcare, we all need to raise our voices and we all need to care about each other we already know that doctors need to care about patients Patients need to care about doctors too. So stand up doctors and let's stand up for doctors.